Good afternoon. Uh, this is Glenn Stevens uh, with the Detroit Regional Chamber, and welcome to our third Diverse Voices, uh, in third in our series. And so thank you very much for taking some time today. I'm going to jump right in a couple of housekeeping issues. First of all, I'm going to join a, have a, a very special guest join us in a minute. But before we do that, please, we want you to participate too. We're going to have about 10, 15 minutes of dialogue between myself and our guest. Then I'm going to bring my colleague Bernard in, and he's going to be able to do the Q&A with you. But we really do encourage you to ask Q&A through the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lisa Lunsford, who is the co-founder and also the CEO of Global Strategy Supply Solutions. I had to check that out because I usually refer to it as GS3, but I want to make sure I spelled it all out today. Lisa, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Well, we're going to jump right in. Um, we know each other well because we've been working on a lot together. Uh, Lisa also serves when she's not running a company and serving on other things that she does to help the community. She's also the chair uh, person of Mish Auto. And she has not only been the chairperson, she's been a great chairperson and very engaged with our auto community and something else we're gonna talk about with regards to our, our CEO Coalition for Change in a minute. But let's just jump right in, uh, Lisa. And the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about as a business leader, um, I would like you to just kind of take us back a few years, take us back one year and bring us to today with regards to how you see we're doing in our auto industry and in our industries here in our region with regards to diversity, inclusion and equity. Okay, well, I'll take it back, uh, way back into the 1900s, just for a second, because that's when I joined uh, the auto industry. And I say the 1900s because my daughter reminds me that I, the you late know, 1900s, the 1900s. The very late 1900s. <laughs> yeah, the late 1900s. Uh, and, and I would say when I, when I came into Ford, I was uh, the second uh, black female engineer to be hired into the Ford Motor Company Plastics Division before it became Visteon. And so uh, that, you know, I've seen great strides. However, I do believe that we have a long way to go. And just to quote some stats that we're all very familiar with, uh, you know, the study that was done for the Automotive 100 Leading Women states that 47% of uh, women make up the national uh, labor force, but only about 24% of us actually work in automotive manufacturing, and then another 18% uh, in retail. And, you know, as of today, 39% of us uh, believe that, uh, you know, things are changing, but that's actually down from 2015 when it was more like 64%. Uh, the Blacks uh, comprise about 12% uh, of the national labor force and 14% of us work in automotive and only 14%, uh, excuse me, 10% in automotive retail. I can name a few of the black executives in automotive, top black. Uh, everybody remembers Roy Roberts, Ed Wellborn, and Linda Cash, but they're all now retired. So we still have Ralph Giles and uh, uh, Don Butler of uh, Ford Stellantis and Ford Motor Company. There are about 16,000 uh, dealers in the US and 8% are owned by women of color. Um, excuse me, 8% are owned by women and only 1% by women of color and 0.3% by Blacks. So I would say in a nutshell, we, we still have a lot of work to do. So when you look at the tipping point or the inflection point that happened last year with George Floyd and, and some of the others, the tragic events, we obviously, we, we, we got that awakening and we a lot of companies got into gear. Not that a lot hadn't been, they had been focused on this. Have you seen a pretty dramatic change in the last year specifically? And how do we keep it going, Lisa? Yeah, of course. You know, uh, we've seen a lot uh, happening, but uh, here's the thing. You know, this conversation is not really new. You know, there has always been some form of diversity to come up in our conversations at, at some point in our lives. And Everyone uh, is learning new words for things, you know, uh, discovering a new way of, of actually explaining what's happening. And 
you know, you know, everyone is uh, surprised to 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 say the least to say, oh, we still have racism. You know, of course we have racism. It's it's always been there. It's just the fact that we have uh, not acknowledged that it's there, and so and acknowledging it during this great awakening, it's been a it's been pretty tough to. Uh, have the discussion to create a starting point for that discussion. So my my uh, my goal or as a CEO is to, you know, meet people where they are for the dialogue to begin. You know, uh, we have to take this take the steps and we have to have good intentions to move this forward because that's what it's all about. It is the intent uh, to start the conversation and to keep it going. And it must go beyond the CEO's tenure. Uh, signing pledges are great because that's a great way to get started. But what are we prepared to do to do the hard work to make sure that we are intentional, that we are moving forward, moving just past the discussion to make sure that when we envision a life for our kids, we are not uh, you know, uh, circling back uh, to where we are today. Well, when you when you I've heard you say that that use that word, um, and you you really given a lot of great thought leadership about intent and being intentional. Um, you just talked about it a little bit, but what would you say to a, a fellow leader, or even somebody who is interested in their company or their organization moving further along this path? What does that mean to be intentional for them? How how would you tell them that they need to start? Well, I'm gonna start with a little story, okay? Because I love stories, you know that. You know, so walk with me, you know, a little bit um, where you go into a company and you meet a potential customer. And when they see me, there's a bias that's already happening, right? So as I'm going through my presentation and telling them who I am, I am this manufacturer, uh, they've already started judging me. They already started judging GS3 as a pass-through because uh, is owned by a woman of color. And there is no way that I could honestly own the, to the, uh, the technology or uh, have the capability to, to invest in new technology developments, let alone have the capacity to scale it. And it's mainly because I am of a diverse demographic and uh, you know they start saying, oh, you're gonna be expensive, it's low quality, it's this that, and the other. And you know it's just all because of that that diverse bias that is appearing. And you know I sit there and I say to them, you know, see me, see me as this woman who happens to be black, who has the Henry Ford moxie to start a manufacturing company from scratch. So I think for companies to do that, they have to perform this self-check, right? They have to, you know, think about the conversations that they're having at the C level, uh, uh, at the C level in which they are talking about a leader, an employee, or whatever's happening in their organization, and they have to they have to start asking themselves if this conversation is recorded and is leaked, what would people listening think of our company values? You know, and you know, I really want to be clear. This is not about beating up somebody for saying something negative. It is about having that conversation and learning and listening to each other so that we get to that place of concurrence, right? We might not be in agreement, but we, we can, you know, get congruence on, on how we should proceed uh, forward. And again, bring out the best of ourselves and that we wouldn't be ashamed to have these conversations in public or in private. You know, I those conversations are so important. And when you're able to do that with people you mentor or people you do business with, that's fantastic. But you've also been able to do it with your fellow CEO peers through something that you've been working on with us. And that is the CEO Coalition for Change. And that coalition started between Mish Auto and Kadia, Cheryl Thompson and her team. And we decided to put our two missions together and make sure that we were working together to really not just say we're gonna move the needle, but, but measure and move the needle with regards to the number of diverse leaders in, in involved in the industry. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that experience because I've seen some pretty interesting conversations between you, you fellow CEOs. <laughs> yeah, um, 
I, I enjoy being a part of that that uh, group because it is so dynamic. And to watch, to to be sitting there and watching uh, some of uh, very large corporations uh, take the take the time because it's so important to them that they get it right. Take the time and do the hard work and come to the table to have that discussion. It is phenomenal because at its core, when we really talk about it at its core, it is talking about affecting, positively affecting social justice through hiring practices, right? And, and sourcing policies by implementing those practices and policies that are sustainable, you know, because the thing is, is that we are trying to form a, a talent pipeline and we have to do that uh, if we are going to be around, you know, um, if we don't have the, the talent, well, you know, you can forget it. The companies are already failing. So, you know, in, in doing this, we are realizing that by, by taking that time to, to do that work, to create that policy, we are now saying and asking, uh, ourselves to, to make sure that we are equitable that we are intentional, that we are about creating talent that can then go into their communities and create additional wealth, create additional opportunities, that they now have access to jobs to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve and do uh, within those communities. And again, creating that positive cycle of uh, economic development, robust economy, and a more competitive America. Amen to that. Boy, that that that's that was almost a drop the mic there, right there, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate. I love. I love how you just drive to that point. When you when you look at uh, before I bring Bernard in, when you look at that pipe, I think I think there's a lot of people that say, you know what, let's just go out and find those people that can give us more engineering talent in this area, or can give us more diversity, or can give us more people in this geography. It doesn't work that way. You need to grow them and you need to nurture them. You need to attract them. When it comes to the auto industry, we like to talk about it being a high-tech global growth industry, but we also like to talk about it being inclusive. How do we get people more interested in this industry and the opportunity that it provides? Well, you know, I think we, we have to expand our recruiting uh, efforts and fish in ponds that we've never uh, fished before, right? Um, and, and when we do that, we have to make sure that we create that infrastructure that makes people want to be a part of it. I think just to bring in new recruits and then just, you know, say, okay, here you are, uh, you're here, thank you for being here, but never really uh, put that network around them so that they can actually grow and thrive. The one thing I loved about Ford when they brought me in was I could really feel like that they were uh, interested in my well-being. They created a network with all of us new recruits, right? I, I can remember, I think it was about 11 of us. And we used to get together, uh, it seemed like every Friday or every other Friday. And it was us along with the veterans of the organization who would uh, you know, give us advice, uh, teach us more about the business, answer any questions, concerns, whatever it was. They couldn't do anything about the weather. You know, or my bad uh, snow driving, you know, conditions. But you know, they were really there to help uh, support me in that. And they would suggest books. They would do the periodicals. They made sure that I was getting the additional training. All of that was lined up. And I think you have to create that same environment, you know, to get people to come in because just, you know, just to say, okay, you're here now. Uh, you're an adult. Make it happen. I think we have to show people. Or, or at least, uh, you know, put some training wheels on for a little bit, you know, and, and help them get there and then just take off one wheel at a time. And then next thing you know, you're out there and you're thriving. And um, I think we have to get back to that. Yeah, that that is so well put. And when you talk about, you know, it's, you know, finding people, recruiting people, and then getting them in a position is one thing, but that that welcoming, you know, that truly to bring them on board and, and I'll, uh, perfect timing to bring Bernard Parker in. Bernard is uh, relatively new to the chamber, certainly not new to the community, but he's going to join us right now. And one of the things that I love about working at the chamber 
is Michelle Hansel, our VP of HR. She hears me say this all the time. And you can ask anybody that our orientation program and the way people are welcome, even in a virtual world, really makes a difference for people. So yeah. Bernard, I'm gonna bring you yeah. on, uh, take over here with the q and I'll let him click his camera on here. Oh, there he is. All right, I'll join you back in a few minutes. Bernard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Lynn, thank you for that. So, Ms. Lisa Lunsford, Global Strategic yeah. Supply Solutions, GS3, CEO. Yeah. You are indeed a pioneer, right? Yeah. You've done some, a tremendous amount of things in your field. So I want to get I want to get personal with you for a minute. Okay, STEM. God has placed you on a path for STEM. Uh, whenever I get a chance, I always have to give a shout out to my own daughter who's graduating from Western this year, biomedicine and chemistry. Oh, uh, awesome. and, uh, yes, ma'am. And so when I did a little research on you, one of the things I realized is that there there have been folk that I send articles to my daughter uh, about women who have our pioneers, and I'm talking about folk today, and you were one of them even before we met. So I'm proud to say that. So you graduated from Bennett College, Greensboro, mm -hmm. North Carolina. What made you decide to go into chemistry? Um, it was uh, my, uh, my uh, counselor. Uh, at first I was gonna major in biology, uh -huh. And she said, uh, you're not going to go to medical school. And I was like, what makes you say that? And she says, such a personality. So I suggest you major in something that will uh, take you far. And uh, so I tried chemistry on because physics, oh, OK, physics was a little too deep for me. So she was, I have to uh, give, give the kudos to her. She was the one. And I, and I fell in love with it. OK. So. A wise woman, and I'm paraphrasing, once said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but it's not, it's not what you're called, it's what you answer to. So who are you? I am, I am my mother. <laughs> I have to think about that one, but I am a intentional woman. I am a daughter, a sister, a friend. I am someone who doesn't want anyone to have to go through the trials that I've gone through to achieve their dreams. I want to always straighten out the road, right? That's not that's not how it works. You know, we're all reminded that we all each have our journey and I'm still on my journey. You know, but I would say that I am intentional. Wow. So we're coming out of Black History Month. We're celebrating mm -hmm. international, uh, and I would rather call it a month as opposed to a day, Inter International Women's Month. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have now, because of COVID, right, so many women, women of color, and Black women who are really turning to STEM right in terms of mm -hmm. of those majors that they pick in college what would you say mm -hmm. to those women now that are actually going through that i mean really i'd love to hear how you reflected back in chemistry and your days when you had physics and you probably had a genetics class or some other classes what would you tell those women now that are actually going through to to obtain their degrees in stem i i would say you know uh I love it. I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I don't think I have words to, like, as I'm talking to my daughter and she's, uh, my, my daughter's an artist. Uh, behind mm -hmm. me is her her uh, picture that, mm -hmm. that she did on, a, on the plane for me. Mm -hmm. And I always say to her, you know, major in math, major in chemistry, major in something that gives you that critical thinking, right? Because you're going to use that all the way through your life. And it's going to make everything that you touch, everything that you do uh, that much better. Uh, it may seem hard, but don't don't say that. Say things like, you know, it's challenging right now, but, uh, you know, I can push through. I can do, I can be, I can achieve anything. And you know, I, and, and I'm loving seeing all these women in STEM. So I would just keep, again, I, the, the words don't, 
words escape me. All I want to do is just scream out, yay, you know, I, yes, come on, I'm, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. That, that truly is awesome. So let me, let me ask you this in, in terms of diversity, um, and a lot of things are changing for women, black women, women of color. Um, stuff ain't changing fast enough, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, right. What do you think uh, really needs to happen? I mean, a real jolt. I mean, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement as a tell folk, and I say it's a movement and I remind folk, Lisa, that you know when you look at France and Germany and Brazil, uh, London, these were all kids that were out there about Black Lives Matter movement, right? And uh -huh. so the world had to kind of take a pause and say, oh, wow, something's really happening. What do you see in your own industry as a pioneer, a big jolt that needs to happen for folk to really start to see that we need to be more inclusive? And as you said, not just say it, but do it. But that's the thing. We just have to start doing it. You know, mm -hmm. stop studying. The numbers aren't changing. You know, the numbers are there. You can, you can turn the numbers inside out as many times as you want. You have to be intentional about it. You have to say, I am going to create this. You know, when we, uh, you, you know, we, we're so intentional about setting up our mission statements, right? Sure. You know, we, we write them out and everything and, and words are pretty and stuff. But what do they really mean? Are we really intentional about it? You know, is it just something that we're doing so we can get our ISO 9000 certification or our QS or TS 16949, or does it just look good in the paper, right? But when you put actions behind it, when you say that I am going to do this, I am going to hire more women. I am going to hire people who don't look like me. Look, my, my company, you know, is, is diverse owned, but I have to make sure that what, that my, uh, feelings, the way my ideals last beyond me, right? That as I build layers up, as we grow, we have more people in between me and, and the factory floor or me and, and another uh, manager, a level manager. I want to make sure that my thinking, my way of life, my values are permeated throughout the organization. So when you do see that mission statement, you know that we are living and breathing it. My, my, my. So let me say, let me love one last question. You said, and, and, uh -huh. and you said it jokingly that you're a product of the 1900s. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. everything has a season. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And as we look forward to our next season in 2030, because this is 2021 now, mm -hmm. how do you see the auto industry? And for, for specifically for Black women, Black women engineers, owners, where do you see it? In 2030, I, I see such a diverse group that we are not even having this discussion. I see where the cars, where the ideas, where everything is flowing so much that America is that turn to country to show the world, show, show the world how it can be done. You know, Detroit is an interesting region, right? I mean, since I made it home about 30 years ago, uh, I've seen the ugly, I've seen, I've seen the good. And the region is really full of well-intentioned and good people, right? And we have touched every facet of, of everybody's lives. I mean, you know, we know how to rise. We know how, you know, of course we know how to fall, but the best thing about us, we fall on our back. So we look it up, right? So we know what it takes to do it. So in 2030, I see where we're not even having to have this conversation anymore. I see where we have different ways of getting to wealth creation. I see where, you know, we have colleges, we have trade, we have agriculture, we have apprentice programs, we have all these different ways that everybody can now participate in their own economic well-being. And I see that where women can actually lead this, you know, and, and not to leave men out now, you know, because, you know, I've had great male mentors who have uh, guided me and, and, you know, they are still guiding me and they're there, but I just see where we're not having to have this conversation, you know, about equity and how to, uh, you know, build this path towards the C-suite. Okay. Well, I, and, and I want to remind our audience, um, again, you, prior to us meeting, you were one of, one of my heroes that I sent um, a bio, if you will, to my daughter because of your field and the things that you've done. And there's so many other Black women like yourself 
uh, like Dr. Corbin, as we talk uh -huh. about the vaccines, right? Who actually yeah. helped develop yeah. and produce the Moderna vaccine. So if Mayor, if Mayor yeah. Duggan is watching this, I got your back, man. Uh, <laughs> we talk about Dr. Shauna Diggs, right? Who used to be yeah. a board of research for U of M, dermatologist. Yeah. Even now, um, Dr. Sonia Eaton, right? Who's a 40 year old mm -hmm. neurosurgeon out of Kalamazoo over at DMC. And so I bring that yeah. up to say that so many of our black women, our women of color, are doing so many great diverse things. And it's because mm -hmm. of y'all where we are. And, and I speak the truth on that. And so um, what I would love, it, it's really not even a question. What I would love to see is more mentoring I want to see us uh -huh. as the chamber, and part of my job is really to make the ask to be more inclusive of pioneers uh -huh. like yourself to be able to tell their story, right? Because we uh -huh. see you up here as a CEO, but we really don't get down and dirty and find out, you know, the stripes that you went through to get your glory to where you are. And, and in fact, you're still going down that path. So yes. I, I just I just want to thank you tell you how much, how proud of you I am. And I can't wait to, to get a copy of this to send to my daughter so she can see that she too is on the right path. And, and that there's someone like her that's been through and the words of wisdom that you've given is so God sent. I really appreciate you. And I, and I appreciate my chamber for opening this up to be able to do this. No, oh, thank you. That means so much. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to read your daughter's uh, chapter. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. The next generation, I'm looking forward to them because I'm trying to retire. So I need them to come in, you know, <laughs> they need to come in and replace me. So, you know, I'm going to to my strike, so. I, I, but you know what? We're gonna have to put you on Damon Keith status, though. You know what I mean? He ain't never retired, but he was around, but he was in everything. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? I'll always be around. I'm always there. Uh, I, I love to mentor. I always reach back into the high schools and the middle schools, the elementary schools. I have seven year olds who make goo and they come to me and tell me that they are going to sell me the goo. And when I ask them uh, how much, they say, well, I don't know. And I say, well, I tell you, go back and give me the, all the ingredients and how much you pay for it. And then we'll set, we'll set the uh, sale. And, uh, and I love right it. I love it. Thank yes, you. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for being a yeah, blessing. Thank you. I'm going to turn this back thank over you. to Glenn, and I want okay. you to have a blessed day. Thank you. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Lisa, thank you. Uh, it, was, it was great thank to have you. you with us today uh, to be part of the conversation. And, um, you know, I'm just going to finish with some, you know, my something I've learned from you, because I've really learned a lot about that word intention, intentional, and it's about how we choose to make decisions and how we take action on them based on what's really important to us. So it's gotta be about the mind, it's gotta be about the heart, right? And yeah. and, I, and, I, and I've learned that from you, you know, through our work with Michado and the CEO Coalition for Change, but but thanks for, for joining us today and for being upfront and, and thanks for helping us straighten out the road. Um, it's, <laughs> It's going to be bumpy and there's going to be some detours, but as long as we got people like you helping us straighten out the road, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about things. So thank you for joining us and thanks everybody thank for you. being on today. The, it will be posted on the website and uh, Lisa, have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. Okay. Have a great day.